Okay, so here we have our jam melon. So you can see it's a little bit um, on the yellow side, it's a little bit older, but it should still be good to work with. That was the good thing about them, they did last quite a long time, so you could always sort of have one on hand. And when they're fresh, they look just like a watermelon. Yeah, in fact, the kids, when they're up in the kitchen garden, get all excited, they're watermelons, they're watermelons, can we eat one, can we eat one? We have to say, well, actually, they, you know, because really they don't have their own flavour. You sort of know it's a melon when you eat it, but it, it's pretty much flavourless. Mm. So um, you can sort of see why they're not so popular anymore. Um, though, I, you know, I do believe they're still used um, in, in, in other countries and probably commercially um, as well. So let's just cut him open this way so you can see inside. They have the most beautiful ruby-coloured terracotta. The seeds, terra are, the seeds terra are fantastic. Terracotta-coloured seeds inside. So we need to... Um, you don't hollow it out uh, like you would a pumpkin. You can actually use all this sort of fleshy part. So think of it along the lines of, of like using a watermelon. We'll have to get the seeds out, but just use the flesh. The smell is, is just the faintest tinge of, of sort of... The... Yeah, it smells a little bit like a... Just the faintest mm. echo of a watermelon. Yeah, yeah. it is more watermelony than perhaps honeydew or, yeah. or rock melon or something like that. So I'm going to have to cut that up take the skin off, get rid of the seeds, uh, chop it up, same with some pineapples, and then we'll get on to the next stop, step uh, of okay. the jam making. And while you're doing that, I'm going to go in the dining room and have a look at the Apern. Okay, okay. get prepped up. So this is the laborious bit. You know, it's a lot of chopping, a lot of preparing, and we just have to remember in, in households like this, the Wentworths themselves didn't have to do any of this. This was the... Um, this was the kitchen maid's job. They had plenty of staff. In fact, we think they had probably eight or nine domestic staff uh, to do all these kind of, kind of chores. Uh, in fact, jam-making parties were quite, uh, quite, quite common, quite popular. I know uh, Mrs McCarthy used to enjoy having her friends around for jam-making parties. And I don't know if any of you have read Anna Karenina, but there's a jam-making party there where... The, the finer ladies and their friends are gathered around and doing their gossiping and drinking tea. It is a jam making party <laughs> because in the background is the cook making the jam <laughs> on a portable stove. I thought that was really cute. So um, yeah, how hands on these ladies actually got is questionable. So I have a bit of a tendency to, to make my jams a little chunky. That's my own personal taste, but that's... Uh, that's where you as the cook can do as you please. Um, if you were making this at home, you could actually use a honeydew melon. It, it has a similar texture. Uh, you don't see jam melons around terribly much. You might see them in a very old-fashioned uh, grocer. I doubt you'll ever see them in a supermarket. Um, I don't know that you could use a watermelon. I haven't tried. It might just actually literally go to water. Um, so, yeah, I think a honeydew might be better. I'm sure there's a more efficient way of getting rid of the pips. But they are rather gorgeous in themselves, these pips. In fact, some countries I know make, make lovely jewellery out of, out of seeds. Don't waste anything. They're these resourceful people. I'm just... So, as with most jam making, it's a two-day process. You need to prepare your fruit the day before and then soak it overnight. Now, interestingly, with this jam, you don't add water. Uh, in fact, you just sprinkle it with some of the sugar that you're going to use for the jam, and that will um, draw out the moisture out of the melon and create its own syrup. So the jam melon itself really doesn't have a lot of flavour. It has got that sort of watermelon-like aroma, um, but it doesn't have that sort of that luscious sweetness um, about it. So really, it's acting as a filler. It's, it's going to help um, make the bulk for our pineapple jam. But because it doesn't have its own flavour of its own, it will sort of drink in, takes on the flavour um, of the pineapple and the sugar as it's, as it's cooked. Um, another favourite was uh, melon and ginger jam. So again, if you weren't quite as uh, fortunate as the Wentworths and had pineapples in your garden, you could... Um, uh, use either crystallised or, or yeah, usually crystallised ginger, which you could buy from a, a chemist shop or a grocer's, and cook that up, 
and get that lovely um, ginger flavour. In fact, I think ginger, you know, when you buy a ginger marmalade or a ginger jam, often they've used something like this as the bulk rather than it being pure ginger, which would be way too strong. Now, the other thing I think that uh, whenever I'm working like this in this kitchen is always to remember that there wouldn't have been any lighting. So it looks pretty vibrant um, here today because of, of, of our extra lights for the camera and things. Uh, but in, you know, in the, in the 1800s, 1828, this kitchen dates back to, um, all the lighting would have been candlelight or you know, tallow candles, which are made out of, well, pretty much old meat, meat fat. And you know, no beeswax candles in this end of the house. Beeswax was way too expensive. And otherwise, um, some kind of oil, um, oil lanterns. So they're the sort of things that when you do, do come into these old houses, they're the sort of things that you have to remember. There was no plumbing, no electricity, no shortcuts. Um, you know, you can see that by the stove, of course. It's amazing how much we take for granted. Every time you open your fridge, uh, just imagine what it would have been like if that fridge isn't there. 